Welcome to the Project Endure podcast, the place where we talk about life, endurance, persistence, perspective, and so much more. I'm Joe Rinaldi, and I'll be your host. Let's jump in. Before we get started, let me ask you a question. Have you ever noticed that what you wear has the power to change how you feel? Project Endure Apparel is designed to remind you that easy won't make you stronger and that growth is an uncomfortable choice that we all have the privilege to make every day. Look good, feel good, and perform good. Head to the link in the show notes to shop Project Endure Apparel and keep on doing hard things. Now, let's get to the episode. Welcome back to the Project Endure podcast, episode 123. We have myself, Joe Rinaldi, and we have a very, very, very special guest in New York City, Tyler Swartz. Tyler, how are you, man? I'm pumped. Um, I've had a hard week and I'm ready to chat. Dude, I've been looking forward to this for a long time now. And we were just talking before we hit record about all of the cross pollination, as you put it, between our two communities. And I don't think that is a coincidence. And I think we'll discover more and more why we have so much in common through this podcast. But to start, how would you introduce yourself to somebody who's never heard of your name? Oh, man, let's go there. How would I introduce myself? Well, first I'd say, hey, my name's Tyler. What's your name? And I'd want to learn about that person first because I feel like I could have many, I wear a lot of different hats and I probably would have a lot of different conversations pending what the person is all about. I'm mm-hmm. a software engineer. I'm a product manager. I'm an only child. Um, I'm a Bostonian. I'm a venture capitalist. I love to run. So I have a lot of different things that I got going on in my life. And I feel like it's pretty multifaceted and we could have a lot of different conversations if someone wants to get to know me. Dude, first of all, I love that you would want to know about the other person. And that is how this interaction began, by the way, before we hit record, I asked you how everything was going. Do you have any questions? And you asked me about me, which I love. Uh, I'm the same way. Now, if you were to strip all of the titles you have away and you were to take away the venture capitalist in you, the runner in you, the everything else in you, who are you beneath all those things? I think I'm just someone that likes to have fun. And I like to look at everything with a half glass full attitude. I'm always trying to find the silver lining and I'm always just trying to find something that the purpose and the reason why it's happening and then try and shift it or reappraise it into a positive. And I think you're doing the same thing with your entire, we're going to go deep here. We're going to go deep. That's for sure. Now I figured since you've got a lot of energy, I've got a lot of energy. We might as well just go deep from the start. I'm going to ask you a question that was phrased to you before we started in the form of a questionnaire, but I'm going to phrase it a little bit differently. Uh, When you look back at your life so far, What's the hardest thing or circumstance that you've ever had to handle that you did not get to choose for yourself? That I didn't get to choose for myself. That's a really good question. I think being an only child. Hmm. Let's talk about it. I grew up and I wanted siblings my entire life. Hmm. And I feel like I would have, I needed mentorship. And I feel like I also could have offered mentorship equally. And I felt very different when I was growing up because I looked at all my friends and they had family and they had, they had siblings and they had relationships that I just could never understand. And that's something that I couldn't choose for myself. And I introduced myself as an only child on this call, which is something I don't uh, always do. But at the same time, I didn't always see the the positivity around that um, because I felt different. But now I realize it's cool to be different and be unique and be yourself. So that was something that I couldn't choose for myself, but I think it's great now. Mm. So two questions. One, where did that shift happen from not loving that you were an only child to now embracing that that is something that makes you you? And then second part of that question is what are some of the positives of being an only child in your opinion? Okay, that's a great question. It's funny, like I can go even into like my adulthood, like post-college days, I felt insecure about this and I still do. I remember I would go on dates with girls and like, 
I was on a date with a girl once and we were playing a game where we just basically, basically asking questions to each other. And one of them is, would you go on a date with an only child? And the girl said, no, <laughs> <laughs> looking at this girl on her first date. And I like, that was in my twenties, like my late, like mid twenties. So like, I've been insecure about it for a while. And then I think I just realized that like, it's cool to be different. It's cool to be yourself. And I think like in some of the other questions that we'll dive into today, like we'll talk about being true to yourself and who you are and embracing that. And when you do embrace your true identity, good things happen. Yeah, I love that. So, all right, let's do this. I asked you before we started, uh, what was the hardest question that you've ever been asked? And you said, what scares you the most would be the hardest question that you would have ever been asked. I'm curious what your answer is. What scares you the most? Two people have asked me that in the past week. Um, um, so I've actually had a little time to think about it. I was in Austin last week and I saw a doctor. Um, he's the type of doctor that you go to on when you're on your like last ditch effort. His hmm. name's Dr. Noah Moose. He's incredible. He works with a lot of the US Olympic team um, and a bunch of Olympic athletes for in the running space. And he does a lot of different forms of therapy. And one of these forms of therapy is he gets you to speak about your emotions and then uses... Um, that release as a way of finding out different things going on in your body. So he asked me what uh, one of the like things that scare me the most is. So I'm primed for this. Um, I think it's losing trust with people. Right now with endorphins, like my whole thing is I'm just trying to build trust with people at the end of the day. Um, and I think it would be a really weird world um, if I didn't have the trust of the people that I love so much. And I'm impacting so much. And I feel like you see this in a world of creators or business leaders or um, someone like yourself. Like you can go out into the world and say something um, and it could drastically change the relationship you have with your community. And that scares me the most right now. Mm. So let's give the people a little bit of context. What is endorphins? Sure. Um, endorphins is a run club. Um, but it's a place for people to come and meet one another in a non-drinking format. And realistically, it's a place for people to hang out with a shared interest. Right now, you know, Mike Zocco said this to me the other day in Austin, Texas. He said endorphins is the new bar. Yeah. Which I, like that really hit a chord with me. It's a place for people to meet one another where you don't have to drink and you can actually hang out with people around a shared interest. When I was in college mm -hmm. and when I was growing up, and I think this goes for a lot of people, and I think this is why it resonates with many, is you're in a proximity mm -hmm. and you don't necessarily always hang out with the people that you have the same hobbies as. Mm -hmm. You do the things that you're kind of, you're in a fraternity or you're in a club and you hang out with those people, but it doesn't necessarily mean you guys have things of interest or common interest. And they yeah. create like relationships that aren't as meaningful as ones that you can do things where you might go hiking with someone and that might be something you both share a really strong passion for, or it could be reading, it could be knitting, it could be whatever it is. Um, doing things with people that share the same interests as you is when um, a lot of good things happen. And I'd say that's when you feel the endorphins. So that's what endorphins is. I could not agree with that or love that anymore. Uh, and it brings to mind, actually, before I say this, let me say you and Mike Zocco share the same energy. And I love that energy. I call it Mike Zocco energy. Uh, for anybody listening, episode 67 of this podcast, go give it a listen. Um, but it also brings to mind another conversation I had in this podcast with a friend of mine, Danny Gewertz, episode 35. To make a long story short, we went to college together. We played football together. Uh, I stopped drinking after my first semester in college. Uh, so I've never had a legal drink, you know, and I, I stopped when everybody else was starting felt very alone, felt isolated, you know, would spend Friday, Saturday nights in the library, in the gym, uh, in a random classroom that was unlocked, crying. And uh, I just always assumed Danny had stuff going on because he was a great athlete. He was a great person. I imagined he was out partying with everybody else. Long story short, we graduate college, go our separate ways. My wife and I are in Maui two years ago on our honeymoon and Danny's living in Maui. So we meet up on the beach and we're talking. And he says, yeah, man, I hated college. And so what do you mean? And he said, no, I didn't drink. And I'd spend every Friday and Saturday night alone, just by myself crying. And I just thought, man, like here I was playing football with this kid, living next to this kid, not knowing that he was hurting as bad as I was hurting, feeling the same way. And I was putting up this facade, pretending to be better than I was feeling. And if I had just opened up, man, we could have had an incredible friendship much earlier on. And I think trust is built in part on shared vulnerability. 
And one of the things that I love that you're doing is bringing people together so that they can share an experience like running, which is so powerful. And I would just love to hear more about why running is powerful to you and any other words you have on what trust is. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. Um, your identity, people are very vulnerable about it. And like, that, that's me with being an only child and people don't like to speak about um, the things that don't make them feel good. And it's funny, the second that you can open up about those things, the second that you're being true to yourself, um, a lot of good things can happen. And that's kind of what happened with me and team sports and running. You know, I spoke about I, when I was growing up, team sports were the most important thing to me because I didn't have siblings. I was an only child. And I found my most powerful relationships in the locker room after a team win. That wasn't drinking. That was like camaraderie, right? That was a little different. And I went to college and I lost that. I absolutely lost that. I had friends and they're still some of my closest friends. We just don't have a lot to talk about these days, um, which is fine. If any of my college friends are listening to this, hit me up because I'd be surprised if they are. Um, and yeah, when I got into running, I was in New York City, fresh off of like drinking aggressively for four years. And I got accepted into a Nike marathon training program. And we put people together. They put people together that came from all different walks of life all different perspectives, all different backgrounds, but we all shared miles together three times a week in person. And I became super tight with those people. And it brought me back to the days when I was taking the bus ride back from a football game and we were shooting the shit with everyone on the bus. Like, that's what it felt like. And I was like, wow, this is really powerful. And then I ended up running marathons with these people. And one of them, his name is John Peasy. He's in his fifties. He's the athletic director at a high school. Like I'm in my young twenties. He's in his 50s. We have on paper almost nothing in common, but we have the shared interest that bonded us. And like I could call him up right now. And if I need something, I know I could count on him. And that's what running has kind of taught me. And I want to provide that for everyone in the world. So why the name endorphins? What does that mean to you? Yeah. Um, endorphins is pretty symbolic for several reasons. Um, it's, it's more than a feeling that you have after a run. I think it's a way of life. Um, and I speak about this with people when I'm present with them all the time. And it goes back to even being true to yourself. We use these two emojis that are on my hat right here. Um, the lightning bolt and the heart emoji, the lightning bolt represents your energy and the heart represents your heart. And I think a lot of people go through life and they're putting their energy into something that doesn't align with their heart. For me, I was a software engineer and I was in VC. And I thought that's what society was telling me should be what I should be doing. And I was putting so much energy into it, but my heart was way over here. And the second that I started investing my energy into where my heart was, which is running and building endorphins, I started to feel like I was actually connected to my true identity and what I should be doing and my purpose. And that's what endorphins feels like that moment on your long run where you just feel effortless and powerful and graceful and amazing. So that's what endorphins means to me. I'm imagining there's somebody listening to this who isn't a runner, but wants to go out for a run just because of the last 10 seconds of what you said. Um, and, and I love all of that. And it, it goes hand in hand with uh, what you, you shared with me when you first uh, scheduled this podcast, which is what you want to do is align your energy with your heart to create a positive environment for all. Uh, and I think that's so special. I also have a quote that I would love to read and then get your thoughts on. Please. So this is uh, anonymous. And we don't know who this comes from, but it goes, one run can change your day. Many runs can change your life. And I would love to hear your take on that as it pertains to your life and the lives you've seen change through running potentially. Yeah. So it's funny. I don't think of running as my outlet here. Um, and I don't read, hear that quote and even think of running. I think of consistency. That's all I hear when I hear that quote. One run can change your day. Many runs can change your life. And it goes back to even what I said about the emojis that we use, the, the emojis, right? Um, aligning your energy with your heart. If you put all of your energy into something that you're passionate about, good things will happen and it will change your life. That's what I heard. And that's what you're doing. And it brings up a question that I had as I was preparing for this podcast, which is, is endorphins what you are doing full time? Or are you still software engineer, Tyler? 
Yeah, so um, I wear a lot of different hats and I do a lot of different things. Um, I'm a creator. I, I even talk, I put videos out there on the internet about running. Um, I invest, I, I program things. So I do a lot of different things, but I'm investing in true venture capitalist form all of my time, every single waking moment of my time into endorphins when I'm able to. Mm. What's the vision for endorphins if there is a vision down the road, whether that be one year, five years, 10 years or more? Yeah, um, if you can't tell, I'm a dreamer. I'm a huge dreamer. I just see a world where we have a place across the country for people to come together and feel the feeling that I'm describing on this Zoom call um, or on this podcast. I want to be able to create that safe environment for 100,000 people. And, you know, I've been saying 100,000 people, and that feels like an astronomically large number today. And I was with someone, his name's John Korn, and I've become close with him via running. Um, and more recently, we shared a really funny experience. We, we met up at 4.30 in the morning at Grand Central Terminal, took a train up to Sleepy Hollow in New York, and then ran 32 miles back all the full length of Broadway. And I've only met him in person twice. <laughs> um, the other time I met him, we ran 131 miles together <laughs> all through the night. And I know I could always count on him or give him a call. He basically said, 100,000, that's nothing. What about a million? So I guess like, I want to impact as many people as possible and create that space and have them feel that, it, that feeling that I've been talking about on this podcast. Yeah. Yeah. And, and while running is the vehicle that you are using to do that, it's clear that running is a part of your life. And you alluded to the fact that you were seeing a doctor earlier and I was browsing your social media and realized that you had just posted about having your first run back. Um, and I, I don't know the context of that. And I would love to hear what that was all about. Yeah. Um, I've been dealing with a herniated disc. I've run 14 marathons this year. Um, I, I ran 14 marathons from January 1st to May 6th, and then I got injured. Um, and I've been trying to get back into it. And it's really funny because I've lost my main outlet, right? I haven't been able to run consistently. Um, and we just talked about consistency. Um, and it's been tough, but I've learned that things in life are nonlinear. Mm -hmm. There's highs and lows. Some days are going to be great. Some days aren't going to be, but you learn a lot about yourself when you're going through adversity. And my adversity is not that grand in like comparison to others, but I think it's a lesson in life that like, there's going to be shitty days. And there's going to be great days and anyone can do great on the great days. It's the people that can dig themselves out of the hole on the shitty days. Um, that those are the people that I want to surround myself with. And that's what I've been dealing with. And I've been trying to stay positive through it. And I went for my first run after seeing Dr. Noah Moose in Austin and I was feeling great. And then lo and behold, two days later, I'm like banged up severely. And it just goes to show like, Hey, it is not linear and I'm going to keep doing everything I can to get back out there. Man. Well, first of all, I appreciate and respect and admire your positive attitude, your relentless positive attitude, it appears. Where did that come from? Where did your optimism come from? Has that always been, Tyler? Yeah, I think it, it's been something that I don't know. It's been something that I've had in my being for a while. Um, something that I even say a lot that my grandfather used to say, um, only the best. And that's how I used to sign off every uh, postcard that he would send me. And I say that in every single post in the endorphins community. I don't think, I don't even think my mom um, knows that I do that. Um, and he was super positive. And I always looked up to him and the way that he looked at life. And I don't think I was always as positive, but I think as life, on, life has gone on, I've just tried to look at everything from a positive lens, like things happen for you, not to you. And Don Fusco is another perfect example of someone that's been saying that recently. Um, and I was just with him and Austin, his story is obviously incredible. Um, yeah. You gotta look at everything. It's happening for you, not to you. Yeah. Yeah. Dom uh, was on this podcast, episode 65. He's a great friend of mine and an inspiration and recent Lee, uh, since we recorded that podcast, he's gone through some serious adversity and he is just so positive and it's relentless. And I love that. And even though somebody can be positive, it doesn't also mean that they're not going through something hard and that they don't have hard days or down days. When you wake up and it's just not one of those days where this energy that you have on this podcast just doesn't come easy. What do you do? Where do you find that? How do you battle through that? It happens a lot. It happens to me today. I think I started this podcast by saying today was a hard day. Yesterday was a hard day. I love hard days. 
I don't know why I love them because I, maybe it's like the athlete mentality inside of me, but I just love grinding and I love battling through and I love when my back's up against the wall and nobody believes in me. And I love just like persevering. I love that. And I think that's the thing that gets me going the most. So I think that's my edge. Now, when you're running marathons, when you're running races, when you're in competition mode, what are some of the thoughts that get you through those painful, hard, uncomfortable moments? Is it that chip on your shoulder? Is it the back against the wall? Or are there other thoughts, other mantras, even more positive ones that might also play into the mix? I mean, here's a really easy one. You can look at a race. You're halfway through a marathon, you're mile 13. You got, oh shit, I got 13 miles. Or you can tell yourself, I've run 13 miles so many times. Like I only have 13 more miles. And I think like that small little adjustment in the way you even approach everything you do goes such a long way. 13 miles. I did that literally 20 times during my training. I can do 13 more miles or, oh my God, I have 13 more miles. Like I think that type of mentality can be applied to anything outside of running as well. And it goes to the half glass full attitude. Yeah. And it, it reminds me of episode 117 of this podcast. Uh, Luke Hopkins shared this example of yellow cars on the highway. And if you go stand next to a highway and you are looking for yellow cars, you will notice the yellow cars. And if you go into a situation expecting the best, hoping for the best, looking for the best, you will find it. That silver lining is there if you are looking for it. And if the opposite is true, if you're expecting it to be bad, if you are looking for the bad, you will likely find the bad. And so I, I love that. I've never met Luke, but we've interacted online. I got to hit him up. Uh, Luke's awesome. And I mean, as of this recording, I believe Luke is 20 years old and he's got the mind of a 50 year old and uh, the body of a, you know, young Arnold Schwarzenegger. So it's, it's I'm a, hit him up after this. <laughs> you should. Um, all right. So we've talked about some of the hard things that you've had to handle, uh, endorphins run club. And I want to transition now to the hardest thing that you've ever done on purpose, whether that be physical, mental, professional. Uh, but when you look back at your life so far, Tyler, what is the hardest thing that you've ever done on purpose and why did you do that thing? Yeah. Um, I feel like I'm going to sound like a broken record, um, which I don't want to do, but I feel like the hardest thing in life has been finding myself. <laughs> and being true to myself. And like, I think I always knew who I was, but I don't think I ever embraced it. I think I was always trying to be someone else, um, someone that the world told me I should be. And I think everyone does that for the most part. Like I'm still doing it to some extent, but I think I'm being much more real with myself. And I think that took a lot of like, I have my journal in front of me. Like I had a lot of personal reflection and a lot of miles probably for me to like really think about who I, who I should be and what I should be doing. You know, people when you're like little, and even maybe at whatever age, they say, you should do what you love. How many people actually act on that? A lot. Like, how many people are stuck at their desk job listening to this or not, like, not doing something that revs them up every single day? Um, and I think it took me, it took me in my, my, like, my entire life to identify what I truly, truly loved. And I'm attacking it every single day now. And I think like that was a really, really difficult for, thing for me to come to life with. That was tough. Yeah. And I'm still trying to figure it out. But that's yeah. probably been the toughest thing I've had to do on purpose, like direct the course of my ship towards what makes me happiest in life, as opposed to what's going to make me the most money. Mm. Yeah. And again, conversation with Luke Hopkins talking about how nobody has it figured out. And if we're, we're being honest, I don't have it figured out. You don't have it figured out. Nobody listening to this has it figured out. Every single day is a brand new experience. Every yes. moment is a moment that we've never lived before. And we wake up and live with such uncertainty as human beings. There's no way anybody can figure it out. Um, and, and I was reminded when you were speaking of a Les Brown quote that I love, it's called uh, the graveyard quote. And it goes, the graveyard is the richest place on earth because it is here that you will find all the hopes and dreams that were never fulfilled, the books that were never written, the songs that were never sung, the inventions that were never shared, the cures that were never discovered, all because someone was too afraid to take that first step, keep with the problem, or determined to carry out their dream. 
And I guess the question for you would be, what has gotten in the way, right? The opinions of others, of course, the opinions that you have of yourself, maybe, but what are the specific barriers? Because I know almost everybody, if not everybody out there listening can resonate with this. Yeah. Um, so many, I mean, you got to put yourself in my shoes and try and think of, I'm working at a VC fund that invests in consumer startups. And I am posting TikToks on the internet, running 40 miles and eating Cheez-Its and McDonald's and acting a little silly. And when I walk into work the next day or the next week, whatever, what the people, my peers were thinking mm -hmm. when I was doing that. And that was like the first time that I was like, oh my God, like, what am I doing with my life? Like, <laughs> what am I doing? Should I go to the side of like understanding what I just did on the internet was not like normal? <laughs> or should I go back to doing what made me happiest? And I, ha I felt like I was in the middle of this tug of war match between uh, my team at work, who I love dearly, by the way, and what I wanted to do. And that internal struggle, I have like, four journals of it, of me just like talking to myself, like there's this concept of cringe mountain, especially mm -hmm. if you're um, posting videos online, this might be something you've heard before, but it's just like, you have to climb cringe mountain in order for you to be comfortable. Um, and until you do so, like, it's going to be really <laughs> cringe worthy and it's still cringe worthy, but like finding comfort in things that make you really uncomfortable is how you can eventually align your heart and your soul to what you should be doing. And I put myself out there, made myself really uncomfortable. Same thing with miles. You find comfort in the discomfort, and then you can be at peace with running 50 miles. Uh, so it always ties back to running, I guess. Yeah. And I, I, you know, something I say or have started to say more often is what you want is on the other side of hard. Um, there's this thing called the paradox principle of sacrifice. And it is essentially saying that the sooner you face the uncomfortable situation, the sooner you can get to the other side. And the paradox is that most people spend most, if not all of their lives running away from discomfort and you can't outrun discomfort. It's kind of just there on your tail for as long as you let it, but you have to turn around and run through it. And so that resonates big time. The other thing I'll say is that I think people are attractive when they are confident and people are confident when they are pursuing something that they care about consistently. Um, there's this uh, so if you've heard of America's Got Talent, um, my wife and I will watch clips on YouTube every now and then when we have nothing else to do. And I can't remember this woman's name. I can't remember the season, but there was this, this woman that got up on stage and her audition was going to be singing. And before she began to sing, I found myself judging her. I caught myself judging her. I didn't like her dress. I didn't like her style. She wasn't my quote unquote kind of person. And I wouldn't have called her attractive, beautiful, whatever. And then she started singing and she was so good. Her voice was so beautiful. She, she wasn't just singing, like she was the singing, like she was one with her art. And in an instant, I was like, wow, that is attractive. That is amazing. That is beautiful. That is so, so, so cool. And my point with all of this is like, when people are truly doing and pursuing things that they love, when they're aligning their energy with their heart, that is beautiful. And in time, crazy becomes cool. So what might yes. feel crazy right now will one day be very, very cool when people understand why it is you do what you're doing. Totally. And it took a while for me to cope with that. And I think that's why it was really difficult for me to make that decision on my own of like, okay, I have these two polar opposites. I have this like really cushy job, stable job that the world says like, this is what you should do. And then I have this other world of like pursuing happiness and pursuing um, impact and pursuing something that makes no sense to this side of the world. And I chose what made me the happiest. And that was the hardest thing I think I've ever had to do. I can relate to that on a deep level after leaving my job for similar reasons. And one of the things that got in the way of me leaving my job sooner was the fear of what would happen with finances was, well, hey, I make more money doing this thing, but I love this other thing more. And I know for a fact, uh, whether it's clients of mine, friends of mine, people on social media, I hear talk about this, that lack of quote unquote stability when it comes to pursuing something that you love or 
you know, leaving that thing that feels secure for what you love is often a barrier. How did you or how are you overcoming that, grappling with that, battling that, right? Because I would imagine endorphins probably doesn't pay the bills the same way that venture capital pays the bills. Yeah, we have a run club. What run clubs make much money? Uh, <laughs> find me one so I can model my run club off of yours. But um, yeah, it's not easy, but I feel so fulfilled. <laughs> I feel so fulfilled with what I'm doing that I just, I don't know, part of me, and I've been saying this to some of the people that are more involved with endorphins, like we're going to make it work. I believe we're going to make it work. And that belief I think is stronger than anything else in the world. Like people can sense it. People can feel it. People can feel the energy. And I feel like when you put good energy, when you put good energy into the world, like that energy is reciprocated, that energy is reciprocated tenfold. And I've seen that in other endeavors, whether it be financial or whether it just be relationships or whether that be with friendship or whatever. Um, so I'm just really confident that we're going to put good energy into the world, which is what we're doing and good things will happen and good things might not necessarily be financial, but I hope, hopefully we'll be able to pay the bills. Yeah. And I think to your point, something that is powerful, meaningful, impactful, you're collecting good people around a common shared mission or goal, right? It will last. If you can find the people, which you are, that will last. And, you know, when I started Project Endure, the quote that was hanging up on my office wall at my old apartment and now is on the office wall of my, my office in the house is uh, The Man in the Arena by Theodore Roosevelt. And I, like you, viewed myself as having my back against the wall, this chip on my shoulder. It wasn't the critic who counted. It was me in the arena showing up. Didn't matter if I got knocked down. Didn't matter what happened. As long as I was there, I was, I was fulfilled and I was proud of myself. And fast forward two years into Project Endure, we have our second ever in-person annual event. And I'm surrounded by these people. And I am in what looks like an arena. And I have a picture of it that I cherish quite a bit. And I realized that they weren't critics. None of them were critics. It wasn't me with my back against the wall. It wasn't me with a chip on my shoulder. It was me surrounded by all of these amazing human beings who saw the world the way that I see the world and who loved what we were building and wanted to be a part of it. And it was so beautiful. And I see that in your social media, right? Like I see the energy at the run clubs and it's amazing. It's off the walls. Uh, and, and that's got to be so fulfilling within itself. Yeah, I think the most fulfilling, and I resonate with what you just said a million fold because that's what's happening to me every single day. We go to this place and I feel like I have a, a people there that understand what I'm doing. Whereas I was coming from this other world where I was surrounded by people in the arena that didn't understand what I was doing, right? So I resonate with that um, tenfold. Um, it's really special. And I'm glad that you understand that because not many do, not many do. So before we move on to the next question, if somebody's listening to this and Let's just say, for example, they also live in or near New York City and they're thinking, I would love to go to the run club, but I don't know, I'm not very social or I just, I'm not a huge runner or I'm a little bit afraid. What would you say to them to convince them to join you guys the next time you run? I wouldn't convince them. I wouldn't try to. Um, I think like that goes back to something I said a few moments ago. It's like the energy that we're putting out into the world is attracting that energy back to us. And if you're meant to be there, you'll find us. And if you're not meant to be there, that's totally cool too. Um, it's super inclusive. It's one of those things where I'm doing like a lot of research just on like community building and like hybrid work models and like PhD level studies on just like creating impact networks. And I'm really nerding out on it and I'm loving it. And we set the purpose virtually before the events of like, Hey, this is a place for people to come together around a shared interest. Like it's cool to say what's up to other people. We say that virtually. We also say that at the beginning of every single one of our experiences, Hey, if you've been here before and you don't recognize someone, you know what to do, say what's up. And because we set our purpose and intention really early, it does create this really awesome, um, super inclusive space. And whether you're alone or you have 10 friends or you're not experienced or you're super experienced, we have a lot of different walks of life that come and it's become a ritual, which is awesome. Yeah, that is awesome. And so the next question I have for you, Tyler, is around the word endurance. And when you hear the word endurance, I would love to know what comes to your mind. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. The first thing that came to mind is um, a day that I ran around the perimeter of Manhattan. 
And this was one of the first times I really went beyond the full marathon distance. And I was with my accountability partner, my training partner, Alex, who's like one of my rocks. And, you know, we don't chat as much as I'd like right now um, because we're doing awesome things in life. But like, again, I know I have him and he has me whenever we need each other. It's one of those type of relationships. Um, and he's pushed me so hard. We're at mile like 27 and I put the camera on him and I go, how do you feel? And he goes, I'm in pain, but we're going to process this and we're going to proceed. Mm -hmm. And that's what endurance really feels like to me is like, let's process it. Let's embrace it. Let's internalize this. Let's feel it. And let's keep going. That's what endurance is to me, at least. And that is, that is really good. I love the process aspect because most people talk about proceeding, about pushing forward, about keep going, but to truly feel what you're feeling in that moment, to experience what you're experiencing in that moment, not to block it out or wish it wasn't happening, but to embrace it and then proceed is really powerful. Uh, I'm curious, what's the most pain you've ever been in while running? Is there a moment that comes to mind, a hardest run per se? Um, I have a few that come to mind. Um, I ran the Chicago marathon. It was my second marathon ever. I was underprepared super underprepared. I was lax, like lackadaisical. I was complacent. I didn't lean into my training program. I did the bare minimum and I knew going into it, I wasn't ready. Mm -hmm. And it happened to also be 80 degrees and 80% humidity. And I got wrecked, absolutely wrecked. And I really went into a deep, dark place during that day. Um, and, you know, I referenced someone, his name's John Peasy. We trained together two years prior, and we ended up running that race step for step with each other. And we battled together. And now he's one of my like homies, 50 plus years old, no, nothing in common outside of running. And we're homies. Um, that's one thing that I can point to. Also, I ran the Tokyo Marathon this year and took five bathroom breaks. <laughs> um, it was a horrible, horrible, amazing race. So those are the two that come to mind. <laughs> oh man. Well, you know, to go back to the connection that can be formed through something like running, I think that shared struggle, shared pain, shared suffering is one of the most powerful ways that two human beings can bond. And that's amazing that you found that through running. The second thing is a quote from one of the co-founders of the New York City Marathon, Fred LeBeau, who said, in running, it doesn't matter whether you come in first in the middle of the pack or last you can say, I have finished. There's a lot of satisfaction in that. And I'm, what, I'm wondering for you, one, have, has there ever been a race where you haven't finished? And well, let me start there. Um, yes. Um, and those are the races that I don't even start. And I think that might not make sense to many, but I think when you think about it a little more, the hardest part of a race is not actually finishing the race is getting to the starting line. And I'm supposed to run the Chicago marathon. I'm signed up for it. It's in what, three, four weeks now and I'm injured. And I keep on telling myself I'm going to run it, but there's no way in hell I'm going to be healthy enough to really give it a good go. Um, so that's a race that I'm definitely not finishing. Um, so yeah, that's how I internalize like not finishing. I'm the type of person that, and I, I even think to this, like Steve Magnus, uh, who's the author of uh, Do Hard Things, speaks about like toughness and mental toughness and being tough. I think it's not tough to power through. We're taught in life to power through. Like if you played football, you know, your coach is like, I don't care if you're banged up, get back on the line, right? That isn't what true toughness really is. Toughness is being able to internalize and process what's going on and make the educated decision whether you should proceed or not. On race day, if you're if I'm there, that mentality goes out the window because I'm there to finish and I will do everything in my power to endure. But on a training day, I'm processing and proceeding. So I haven't, for the races that I start, I will hardly ever not finish unless I'm really, really banged up. But the races that I don't finish are the ones I don't start. That was a long-winded answer. It was a great answer, though. And I have that book, Do Hard Things, right next to me on this desk. 
Uh, it's also tattooed on my chest and also on the wall of my office. And it means a lot. And I, I think sometimes the hardest things or the toughest things, like you said, are not, it's not pushing through all of the time. Sometimes it's recognizing that the smartest thing for longevity, sustainability, or just the best option is not the one that continues forward. It might be pausing. It might be taking a step back. It might be going to the left, to the right. And that might not be popular. You might be afraid of what other people think. You might be afraid of what you think of yourself. But if you can process and recognize that what you're about to do is truly best for you in the long term, making that decision and sticking to it is toughness. That is hard. And I think one of the, the hardest parts about doing those hard things is dropping the ego. And I would love to hear any take you have on the balance between confidence and ego, because to start anything, let alone something as successful as endorphins has been and will continue to be, you need confidence. You need to believe that it's going to work, that it's going to happen. And at the same time, you strike me as, as a very humble person. And so how do you balance the confidence and the humility? Sure. I have so many things going through my head. And I think this has been all through the path of me trying to identify myself. Think about me as an only child. I had a huge ego. Think about me trying to start companies or like trying to do what society told me. I was confident in it, but I also had an ego associated mm -hmm. with it. And um, I think there's an ego associated with anything that you're doing in life. It's hard to fully remove yourself from it. But like the more you can internalize, internalize who you are and reflect on who you are, you realize that it's sometimes cooler to not have an ego, right? And like when people talk to me, people will introduce me as the founder of endorphins. I don't even like that. Like, I think that's too strong. Like I, I like to be called the organizer. Like I've really tried to remove my ego from the madness because I think the second that there is an ego, that is not genuine anymore. And I don't think you're being true to yourself. So I think there's definitely a level of confidence associated that we're doing. Like I'm over here telling you, we're going to make it work and we're going to have a huge run club and we're going to impact so many lives. But at the same time, like the way that we're building endorphins, I'm trying to remove myself from it. Like in a perfect world, I know in 10 years, I might not actually be able to be the face of endorphins. I'd love to be able to fade away and have it still exist. So you have to remove your ego early or else like you can't have that with longevity. You can't have that legacy. Mm. What I, do you think that? Ego oh. and legacy are like completely like non, not connected whatsoever. Op opposites. Yeah. And, and I think one of my, I, I've, I've come across many definitions of what leadership is, and this is not uh, word for word. I'm going to butcher this, but. I think some of the best leaders that have ever walked uh, on this planet have been able to galvanize people around a mission, a cause, whatever it is, and let those people run with it without needing to be at the forefront, without needing to be the face, without needing to be the everlasting organizer. And that's a really hard thing to do because you are the one who had this vision, who has this vision you are the one who started this thing. And to let that ball continue to roll requires a certain level of trust and a certain level of letting go and a certain level of surrender, which I would argue is also letting go and surrendering the ego. But that loss of perceived control is also really, really hard. Um, why, and do I, think, why do you think when you asked me what my greatest fear is, and I said, trust, I right? like, that's it. Like, I trust Mike Zaka to run with endorphins in Austin and make it whatever he wants it to be. Truly, as long as he can show up on Monday morning, which is what we do, like whatever else he wants to do, it's totally cool. And that goes for any other person that's involved with endorphins that wants to set up a chapter. Like it's trust, we trust each other, like, and that's it. And I think it, this would not work without Mike Zaka. Like we would not be able to impact as many people, right? Um, and he knows that. And we've been super open and vulnerable about it. And um, it's all trust. And I don't think people will trust you if you're a huge ego. I couldn't agree more. And so we've talked about a lot of good stuff, Tyler. And I know there are people listening to this podcast who are struggling with various things. And maybe it's trying to let go of the ego. Maybe it's switching career paths, trying to align their energy with their heart, despite the resistance that they find around them in this world. And no matter what it is that somebody's struggling with, 
if you could speak directly into someone's ear who's listening to this podcast, who's just going through a hard time, having a bad day, really struggling through something, what would you say to that person? I'd say everything is temporary. And I would say, think about where you'll be in a year from now. Think about where you're going to be in five years from now. Like the feelings that you're absorbed in at this current moment in time are temporary and they're not going to last forever. And with that type of mentality, you can think about all the good things that are to come and hopefully they can help you come out of that low place that you're in. And that's how I'm approaching my injury right now. Like that's what I'm telling myself every day. Hey, I'm going to be healthy eventually. I'm going to be healthy sooner rather than later, hopefully. Right. Like I know that I, I dream about myself being on my two feet running. Right. So everything's temporary. Everything's on linear and pulling yourself out of a tough place is hard, but that's when you learn the most about yourself. And couldn't have said it any better myself. And it makes me think of a very common phrase that I think is incomplete for most people. And the phrase is this too shall pass. And I learned a few years back that the full phrase is this too shall pass. And this too shall pass, meaning the good times pass and the bad times pass, the easy times pass and the hard times pass. It all passes. And someday we're not here anymore. And so I think that contrast of life and death, the now and then the ebb and flow allows us to find beauty in those moments of pain and potential suffering, because we do only get to do this once. And we're here right now and you're feeling what you're feeling. And that's a unique human experience to you. So I love that, Tyler. And, you know, before we wrap this up and I point people in a direction where they can connect with you and endorphins, is there anything else that we didn't cover or anything else that's on your mind that you think we should uh, share with the people? No, but I think um, I'm really grateful for this conversation because um, in a way this was meditative, like this was, we went pretty deep right away. Um, and I really appreciate the questions that you threw at my like they're awesome i'm glad that we got to speak about aligning your energy your heart i'm glad that we spoke about processing and proceeding those are like two things that i preach pretty heavily so i'm glad that we got there uh, i'm glad that we got there too i'm grateful for the depth of this conversation i'm looking forward to growing our friendship and if somebody out there wants to reach out wants to learn more just wants to connect where should they do that for you and and for endorphins yeah uh several ways we have endorphins cities we're in six cities we'll be in 20 in the next 18 months is the goal um so find us in one of our cities we're in dc boston chicago philly austin and new york city come say what's up to me like that is one of my favorite things is when people come up to me at the run and say hey like this is so cool <laughs> come say what's up um that would be the best case scenario if not you can find me on social and we can connect there um, you can hit us on the endorphins social pages as well. And yeah, but that would be the best. Let's run together. That'd be the best thing. I love that. Well, I will link that down below and, uh, you know, just thank you again for this, Tyler. Thank you for the energy that you bring to this world and the things you're doing. It's much needed. And I'm looking forward to grabbing a run together at some point here. Yeah, I can't wait. Thanks for having me. This is awesome. If you enjoyed this episode of the project indoor podcast, Go ahead and subscribe, leave a review on your platform of choice, and share this episode with a friend. It helps us get more conversations like this out to more people like you. We appreciate you, and we'll talk to you next time. And one more thing. If you're looking for a community of people all striving to be better together, check out the Project Indoor Hard Things Club. The link is in the description below. We'd love to have you.